first and foremost, you know, want to thank everybody for taking time out of their schedule to join our webinar today on 10 permanent mold questions you need to know. Uh, we're really excited to have you here. Uh, and again, any questions you may have, please feel free to ask them in the questions section and or the chat section. Uh, we'll try to answer questions live as, as we get them uh, and as they fit into the presentation. But do keep in mind, we'll, we'll try to answer anything we can at the end of the webinar. Uh, and as well, this presentation and uh, slide deck will be available at, after the, the recording today. So before I get started here, uh, you know, I'm thrilled to introduce our fantastic speakers we have. Uh, so joining us here today are Tim Weber and Trevor Bovard. Uh, between these two gentlemen, we're, we have 60 years of permanent mold industry experience. Anything from engineering to operations, foundry, tooling, machining and polishing. So at this time, you know, I'd like to hand it over to those experts, Trevor and Tim. All right, good afternoon, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for uh, coming and watching us here. There you go. I'm ready. All right, let's jump in. Uh, question number one, what's your annual usage? Um, so, so why is this important? We're always trying to match the process to the part. That is critical. You know, uh, time to market, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of time spinning your wheels. If the volume is too low, maybe there's a better process like sand casting. If the volume is too high, uh, it might be better to invest in a die cast tool. Uh, you know, our sweet spot is 500 to 35,000, but we found that typically, you know, in the 12 to 3,000 range, we have a lot of product in, in that area. Uh, so we want to make the make sure the product matches the process. Um, and it's also important, you know, to um, maintaining the cost in the mold condition. Uh, the setup cost is critical to your, you know, your final piece price. So making sure that we've got, you know, permanent mold volumes matched up with what your requirements are. That's a story that kind of comes into play with this. We had an engineering group come and, and look at some tooling and one of the ROIs that they were looking for was a year payback on that tooling. Uh, after all the number crunching came down, it was going to be 1.5 years on the payback and that's just something their company couldn't live with. But so, you know, it, the opportunity was not a match. So it's good. We saved them some time and they went some, they found a better process, a quicker process. Yes. Question number two, what is your end application? So, you know, are you experienced in the field? Is it a brand new, uh, you know, part that you're looking at? Um, you know, where, where's this going to end out in the, um, in the industry? Uh, are there any regulations that you got to be aware of? And then, you know, what kind of design opportunities can you get from that? Yeah, so recently a purchasing manager came to us and uh, uh, had been struggling with a supplier, a couple suppliers on a part, and it was for something that we're doing in a couple of, for a couple of other customers, uh, and it was a cover in the transportation industry. It was a similar application, but it was non-competitive to our other uh, existing uh, products, uh, and they we asked them leading questions. They didn't know exactly. Uh, a couple of problems they were that were experiencing, we were able to ask them and, and kind of draw them out to find out, you know, it had to be structurally sound, it had to be leak proof, but ultimately it had to look really good. So there was a bunch of design considerations we had up front, uh, ended up a perfect fit for Parmobile. So it was good to ask those questions up front. Uh, question number three, what's the size of the piece? Uh, this is important to know, and this is the kind of questions uh, that the founder should be asking you. A sweet spot for uh, per mold is a couple ounces to 110 pounds. We find a lot of product in the three to 30 pound range. Uh, if it gets bigger than that, it could have design constraints that would affect gating and mold design. Um, and can the foundry make it? Do they have the equipment to run, um, you know, to run your product in its, its size? Um, is it a stretch for them or are they comfortable, um, you know, with that type of uh, part size? What's your thoughts, Trevor? Yeah, so bring to mind like a, a, a medical application where we had um, a part that's being transformed uh, into uh, a base that needed to weight to keep the center of gravity down. Um, so we were able to suggest zinc versus aluminum in that application uh, in order to aid the customer with that uh, in order to get the get the weight and the center of gravity down, and, and so the car wouldn't tip. 
Hey, Trev, we just had a, a good question come in. Um, so is there any benefit to using zinc versus aluminum? And where have you seen kind of the zinc used uh, in, in applications? Well, there's different types of uses for the zinc. Uh, one of the main applications is the fact that it's two times as dense as aluminum. So therefore, uh, you can get a heavier part in a smaller package. And if that's a needed item, uh, that's where you could use zinc. Another good characteristic of zinc is its bearing factor. Um, so a lot of times they're used for uh, bearings for wear, so you don't tear up the original piece of equipment. These are sacrificial pieces. That's another application. And then, you know, a final application is surface cosmetics. They can, you know, you can really finish zinc up to be like a mirror finish and, and you, you go out for plating or whatnot. But um, yeah, that's one of the other applications. It, and then, Tim, is there is there any uh, sweet is there a reason there's a sweet spot for the two ounces to like 110 pounds that permanent mold casting typically sees? Yeah, there. I mean, there are some parts that absolutely have to be permanent mold. We know that, and so we evaluate those volumes on the lower end up on the higher end. Uh, but the processing of permanent mold is a lot slower process. Uh, it's typically air cooled. It, it's it uses static gravity, so it's a slower process. So um, like I said, there are parts that definitely have to be per mold, but at some point it might become uh, more cost effective to go another route. Okay, great, thank you. So question number four, um, you know, what is the history of the product that, that you're looking to get done? Is it new or is it an existing product that you wanna change from a different process? Uh, were there problems associated with the existing product? And why are you looking to move? Um, you know, can you get some help to improve the efficiencies on, on for that product and get an improved design um, by using a casting process? Yes, yeah, so, so with, uh, Trevor will remember this. We were in a meeting uh, down in Carolinas and a manufacturing engineer walked in and gave us a, a, a part. And it was it was a piece that was literally made of at least seven, if not 10 different pieces. And what they had done was a fabrication. Uh, they were mechanically fastening this piece together. Um, and what we were able to do in, in permanent mold was to make that as a one piece casting. Um, it was more robust. Uh, it was much cheaper. Uh, it was, uh, lead times were, because it was one piece, lead times were cut dramatically. Uh, they paid off their tooling in record time, I believe three months, and they had one part number. So. Uh, that was a that was just a perfect, you know, taking of an existing fabrication and moving it into a, a permal casting. Yeah, that was a neat design. Hey, so you guys had mentioned uh, a good question came in on uh, static or gravity casting. Um, so kind of explain that a little bit more and how that works, and maybe compare it to some of the other common processes such as maybe die casting or sand casting. Want to take that one? Sure. So uh, gravity casting is basically a method of pouring metal into a mold using the force of gravity. That's what gravity casting is. So you can do that uh, multiple ways. Uh, you can use a tilting um, machine to tilt it at a, a, a consistent flow rate, or you can uh, dump directly down uh, into the casting. Um, all, all different applications for different type of parts. Um, and also you can do a tilt with a dump. Uh, sounds kind of weird, but uh, there's all different applications for different types of parts out there. Yeah, and the majority of parts that we run into are tilt pour. There's just a lot of benefits to the tilt pour. So we can maybe talk about that later, but the tilt pour gives you a lot of uh, attributes from the aluminum alloy that you would not get in another uh, casting uh, process. So in, in lines of that, so Joe asked a really good question as well. So are you, is permanent mold casting getting less frosty than you would see in something like a sand casting? Yes, because you can control the flow. A lot of the porosity comes from turbulence um, when the flow is entering the, the mold. Um, so if you can control the flow at a given rate, you have the tendency to get a more dense casting. And, and the solidification pattern. So permanent mold cools from the inside out 
and from the bottom to the top. And that's critical. It's very organic, homogeneous. You don't have isolated uh, thick spots, hopefully, in the design. That way you get a dense, uh, like I said, a very solid casting. So permold's used a lot in applications where they have to um, have a dense part, porosity free part, you know, explosion proof castings, food service, medical that applications, that type of thing. Great, thank you. Yeah, so question number five is, will you need engineering support? Um, again, I think this is something you need to ask right up front to the foundry. Um, why it's important? Um, a lot of foundries in particular, we do it in-house, but this is all we do. We do castings 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's all we do. Uh, a lot of times people bring in a part to us that it wasn't designed as a casting or it might be a fabrication or they're still in the design process and trying to figure it out. So, you know, working with your foundry up front, it helps with lead times. It helps work out, you know, critical design features. You know, we'll have our engineers talking with your engineers. Um, Eventually, if we are lucky enough to get the work, we'll run through things like finite element analysis. And we've also got other type programs that our engineering staff utilizes, uh, you know, scanning, 3D scanning, you know, making sure your part looks like and measures to what the model you gave us. So uh, some thoughts on that, Trev. Yeah, actually, uh, one second. Uh, so, uh, Tim, you had mentioned the, the finite element uh, analysis. So that's actually a question that's coming up in chat here. So. Uh, you know, different companies have different softwares to help evaluate that stuff. Um, what what type of softwares do we use and processes do we use to evaluate the flow rate and, and turbulence to help reduce that and create a, a solid and solidification process for our parts and molds? What type of specific software? No, just just the, the process that we walk through uh, to, to do that. So I guess the type of things we're looking for in an FEA. Okay, so yeah, in the FEAs, we're looking for the flow for sure, uh, seeing how it's flowing, making sure it's not turbulent. Uh, we're looking for the solidification patterns uh, to make sure that it's it's flowing from uh, the coolest portion of the tool, which would be the center to the, the gating system. So you want to keep your gating system hot, and that's all the designs that you want to look at into that. And then if there's any strength uh, associated with that, uh, that's coming from the therms, if we're stress, putting stress into the casting where we don't want to, uh, you can look at all those types of things with the FEAs. Trev, what's your thoughts on the engineering input up front? Yeah, so, you know, it kind of brings the story where we're able to take, you know, existing product that didn't have any documentation, uh, yeah. some reverse engineering on it, um, you know, that could be an application uh, where we can get that back into a CAD system. That way, you know, you have uh, control of this, this product now and be able to design tooling off of that. So Eric asked a good question that we had talked about a couple slides back, but may come into play here. Um, you know, is there a cost difference between what we see in aluminum or what a, a, a permanent mold company could see in aluminum versus a zinc? On which which aspect on on tooling or on casting in general? Maybe maybe answer both. So you know, start with maybe the 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 product itself. So starting from a zinc product versus an aluminum product. Okay. Well, um, in general, uh, depending upon the shape of the product and the complexity of the product, is gone kind of hand in hand with what, how uh, simple or how complicated a tooling is. Simple meaning uh, lesser cost and, and complicating being more cost. Uh, those kind of go hand in hand with both. On the casting side, it just depends upon, you know, the, the uh, cost of, of your raw materials that you've got to get to go into the part and the secondaries that are involved to get what the design of that part requires. Um, so either one can be, you know, uh, expensive or either of them could be less cost. I mean, what are your, what's your thoughts? Well, I mean, we, is a, a correct statement to say probably tooling for permold and zinc versus aluminum is about the same. Yes. Okay. So that, so the tooling is going to be similar and then the piece price is just going to be determined by the part itself, yes. you know, by, by the application. So. Good. Thanks. Uh, question number six, uh, what is the lead time and scheduling needs? So going into uh, any type of situation, we need to know, you know, what your lead time expectations are. Um, can they be met? 
uh, for one, we want to make sure, and when does the clock start ticking? Uh, when do you need it by? Uh, able to, are, are you able to hit uh, appropriate stage gates at the time that you need to hit them? Uh, those are some of the things you need to look for uh, when checking out for permanent mold. Yeah, and I think the communication part, that's huge. Just, just communicating up front what your expectations are. So I don't know if Trevor remembers, but several years ago, uh, we had an engineer, engineering manager contacted us, and they had a, uh, a part for the boating industry. Here it is. And it was a, a completely baked um, design. So there was not much that we had as far as input, but it had to be permanent mold. Um, this was right at Christmas, and they communicated to us that they wanted parts uh, in a very, very short time, um, almost unbelievably short time. However, because you know we had talked with them up front and we worked out some of the questions, uh, we were able to produce the, uh, the parts in the time frame that they needed. Uh, they had actually told us up front that this was going to be, it had to be permanent mold, but eventually the volumes would get to a point that it would go away. Um, the end of the good, good news was we ended up running hundreds of those, 350 parts a week of that for over 20 years. Actually still running a, a sister part to that right now. So um, just communicating what your expectations are as far as the uh, uh, when you need those parts. And is there a ramp up? You know, is there a you know, first article? You know, when, when do you need that? When, is, when do you want that stuff in-house? Hey, Tim, kind of a great question that came in from uh, from Don here. So, Don, thank you for the question. Um, and it kind of fits into timing here. Is there a, uh, an economical way to make prototypes uh, that we or that you see within the permanent mold industry to be able to prototype parts before we get into production? It's a great question. We tried one, though. We've addressed well, it several ways. Yeah, there's multiple ways to do it, and it depends on what type of application you're looking to do. Are you just looking for form, fit, and function, meaning do you just want to get a touchy-feely part in your hands? That can be done with 3D printing uh, easy enough. Um, there's even technology out there now. If you need to test out the structure of the, of the casting, you can get 3D printed molds and actually pour them. Um, there's multiple ways that, that you can get to that prototype condition. Uh, it can even go as far as, uh, you know, uh, once we get the tooling in to prototype some parts out, and if we have, there's modifications that need to be done, we can do that also. Exactly. Great. Thanks, guys. Yep. What are your finish requirements? Question number seven. So um, I think this is, we get this asked as much as anything. Um, permanent mold gives you a, a pretty doggone good as cast surface coming right out of the mold. Um, and this is controlled a lot by the uh, mold coatings. Uh, also, upfront design considerations because the mold coatings uh, that we apply, they're in there for an entire shift. So when we ask for two or three or four degrees draft, that's so the mold coatings can last throughout the, uh, the process, uh, the, the eight hour shift uh, and not break down. What starts breaking down is when you start having issues with uh, different type of scabbing, different kind of undesirables. Um, the other thing is secondaries, okay? If coming out of the mold, is there anything else you need done with it? You mean, to ask the foundries, do they have in-house finishing? Do they do uh, mechanical polishing? Do they do um, you know, uh, uh, different types of uh, automated polishing? So those are the kind of questions I think you'd want to ask the uh, foundry up front. And again, the communication of what exactly you're looking for uh, in the final product. You know, is this something that you're going to put exactly right out of the mold onto your assembly? Or is there you know, multiple stages to get it to that point? And we had a great question come across on finishing. Uh, so can you prevent sink marks from forming on the opposite side of the gate in aluminum castings? Sink marks. Yeah. Yep. Yes, you can. One of the, um, speaking of finishing, it's a big topic uh, in the for anybody uh, in any in industry is the final look of the product. Mm -hmm. So kind of brings to mind, you know, a story where we had a project, the design team came to us on, you know, a construction project that was going to be very architectural and very visual. And we, we, you know, we were all able to come to an agreement on, you know, what that need needed to be. Yeah, it was a great project. I mean, it actually outlasted all of our competitors because of that reason. They had to have uh, a good looking part but then it has to be made up to extrusions and extrusions are always perfect right out of the die. So uh, it was a cool project. 
Hey, so we had two questions actually come across here from Joe and Nick. Um, what is the, the minimum draft angle you work with? And are you saying three to four degrees draft per side? Can you explain the draft a little bit better here? Sure. So um, minimum uh, draft angle is three degrees uh, for functionality. Uh, when you get into the finishing side, if it's in respect to that last question, uh, you want to look at more of the five degree uh, plus um, with that for the finish uh, to maintain, uh, like Tim said, tooling and coatings. Um, and that is basically included. So we have each side's going to have draft on it. Uh, you cannot uh, cast tray wool uh, in any type of system or process. So yeah, it's going to have it all the way around. Great, thank you. Kind of goes into our question number eight. What are your wall thickness and draft requirements? So, um, you know, it can't be too thin, can't be too thick. Uh, does it become an issue? Um, you know, what are the minimums what are, that you can live with? And then also keep in mind, you can, you, you know, you can come back in with secondaries and sharpen a wall up if you need to make sure that it's straight. Uh, but if you have, you know, all processes and casting have to have draft requirements. Yeah, the wall thing is, a uh, minimum wall thing is for permanent molds about 180. And why do we need 180? Well, again, the, the, it's a gravity cast. So the metal is cooling as it flows. So to get a proper fill, uh, and as, remember, as the metal's going in, we're evacuating the air out. So to get that, that proper amount of uh, movement, we need a minimum of about 180 thousandths. That's that's kind of the, the bottom. We've gone down to 115 different areas, but because personally we we get involved a lot with the secondaries, we can work with you on that. Yep. Hey Tim, are there are other <laughs> things. Uh, Jason asked a great question here. Thank you, Jason. Uh, other than draft angle, uh, blend radius, and consistent wall thickness, are there other design considerations that should be looked at it to reduce part costs in permanent mold uh, casting as well as part fallout? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the critical things are, um, so again, wall thickness and draft requirements, um, minimizing any type of uh, isolated thick sections. The thickest section of the part is gonna determine how much time it's gonna take for that part to cool. So we've got a, a completely, uh, you know, the, where all the walls are consistent, throughout that mold will probably produce more parts per hour than if you've got an isolated thick section somewhere. Um, this reminds me of a product project where we actually had a, a salesman from another company altogether bring us a product that they were just struggling with. Uh, they were having a, a, a lot of rejects. Um, it was an explosion proof housing, flames can't get through it. Uh, and they brought it to us, but we noticed some problems right off the bat. And what you have to have is you gotta be able to have uh, where the mechanics of the mold work. You know, you can't be fighting the cast and getting it out of the mold you know, ejecting it out, uh, having having to uh, put coating on one area, you know, babying the part. The mold just has to process. It's got to be like a popcorn. It's got to be over and over again. So we went back and forth with them because this was kind of a mature product, but eventually we ended up agreeing on that it was that look, we need these minimum design considerations, wall thickness, and primarily draft. Draft was the key. Uh, we did get that uh, and worked that out with the customer, and that is, those parts run like scared deers. I mean, those are that's a good part for perm mold now. So with part of that, you run into like this, is there in permanent mold, is there a way to filter metal out? And do you see it done in certain industries or fairly often? Filtering the metal going into the mold? Correct. Yes. Yeah, that yes. is. The filtering is used throughout the uh, permanent mold. Uh, you can use filters, uh, filtering in any cast application. Yeah, there's some exciting things going on in perm mold with filtering right now. Uh, we're actually experimenting with someone on a new mold which just arrived today, and it's kind of it's it, it does a lot of things. Um, so the absolutely great question for, for sure. And then, are there any specific industries you see it typically used in? I know you discussed this application. Um, are there? Do you see it in FDA type stuff, food industry, uh, medical industry? The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> it's all the above. Uh, we've got we, the, the mold we just got in. It's it's got a it gets polished, 
So we can't have turbulence. We can't have uh, inclusions. We can't have shrink. Uh, we have to have consistent uh, metal flow, consistent quality of metal going in. And that bolt just arrived, and it's got a real unique uh, type of uh, filtering. Uh, but like you mentioned, uh, food service for sure, uh, medical for sure. Um, what else? What else are you thinking? Uh, yeah, food service, medical. Um, so it, it's used in a lot of industries, but not necessarily used in every industry. Would be a good way to put it. Okay, great. Yeah, thank yeah. you. It just you got to use it in the proper spot. You don't use it. The majority of molds won't have it, but it, it does open up a lot of possibilities. It kind of goes back to that that end usage of the product. You know, if it's going to be something that's you know away from anything like a base, right? Um, necessarily probably doesn't need it, right? Uh, because it's it's a base that for the food industry doesn't need it. It's got some wheels on it to roll a car around or something, maybe. Maybe that's the application. So it kind of goes back to part specific on what on what a you know a customer needs. Thanks, guys. Yep. Uh, the, the question number nine is um, what are your as cast tolerances? So in the permeable process, it's a it's a precision, it's a near net shape. Um, can we take that part out of the mold, saw the gate off, trim it, and can we put it right into the uh, the assembly? A lot of times you can't, especially on you know some of the things we just mentioned. Um, many times though we can't, so you need to have secondary. So those type of things need to be taken into account up front. Uh, taking apart and adding some machine stock, for instance, um, for secondary, you know, for cleanup. Um, one of the things you want to ask the foundry is if there is secondaries, if you're going to be doing uh, machining, do they do that in house? Is that something they control in house, or do they outsource that? Uh, and and then also we talked earlier about working with the engineers. You know, working with the engineers up front and say, look, this is a part that we can cast this or, hey, let's go ahead and, and trim this part on a machining center. And while it's in there, let's go ahead and knock these holes in and tap these holes or or put a, uh, a you know, an O-ring gasket in or whatever. So with any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it brings up some good stories. It's like casting in general. You know, you can get to the near net shape. That way you can minimize any type of secondaries. But then again, you got to make sure that those tolerances for that near net shape will fit your process. Uh, you know, your fundamental end product. Right. So looking at question number 10, uh, have you budgeted for the for the tooling? And it kind of goes back to, to our ROI, um, you know, discussion. Uh, will you be able to pay off your tool in, in a timely fashion, whether that's permanent mold, sand casting, die casting? And, you know, what's your expectations for life of a tool? Um, you know, how long is this project going to run? Is it going to be a year uh, long project and be done? Or are you looking at a 10 year project, a 20 year project? Um, you know, those are the type of things you need to look at when you're asking that question. <laughs> Tooling comes up all the time. It's, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's, a, it's something you, you got to just figure out up front. And do you have it in your budget? And what's the time frame? What's the ROI? Um, we just did a job for a, a cereal company. And they had a lot of experience in castings, uh, a, a variety of castings. So one of the things that we talk about is, you know, tooling experience, um, uh, understanding what they're getting, um, and making sure we're comparing apples to apples. You know, this is what the per mold process is going to give you repeatedly, repeatedly over and over again. Uh, these are our experiences. This is where we think it's a good match, uh, or maybe it's not a good match. Maybe we can offer some other other routes to go, but. Um, you know, having that a little bit of background, and we've got a lot, we have a lot of background in Permarco. We have a lot of years. So I want to throw the 10 questions that we have back up on the screen here um, and, and, and kind of open it up to uh, remaining questions from the audience. Um, there were a lot of very, very good questions that people had sent through and a couple that, um, you know, I'd like to ask you, you guys here uh, as we, we come to a close here. Um, so you had mentioned different types of secondary applications that we, we that you, you can see provided to a permanent mold casting, um, anything from coatings, polishing, machining. Do you guys uh, in the permanent mold industry see any kind of overmolding use? And is that a possibility? Absolutely. We uh, we uh, we are for sure. We see that a lot. We see that a lot. Um, um, in the lighting industry, for instance, uh, in the medical industry, it's something we see quite often. Um, so 
you know, over moldings. So the first thing typically we'll see is a heat treat. So that's a secondary. And then you might have a polishing or you may have a secondary machining or powder coating or impregnation, possibly painting, um, hipping. There's all types of secondaries that we've done over the years. Uh, again, your product will determine what, what we end up doing. And typically, uh, a lot of what you see is done in-house. So this is one of the questions you want to ask your founder. How much of this do you actually do in-house? Uh, even in the transportation industry, you know, there's a lot of work done. Absolutely. So another good question here uh, from Tom. Uh, great question. How much material do you recommend for machining flat surfaces? So you had mentioned earlier in the presentation that oftentimes, you know, you can't in any type of casting, you really can't develop a straight wall and draft is often required. Uh, so how much material do you typically see in the permanent mold industry for machining out flat surfaces? Well, you're looking right around a 16th, but it, again, it's all, it's all product dependent. Um, and the application of, do you just need to get a certain area of that wall that needs to be flat? Or do you need the whole wall? It's kind of a question of product design at that point. And and how much and, and the length and the width of the of the cut? You know, is it across the parting line? So this is where the uh, interaction with our engineering group is important. So you say this is what we need, and the engineering group will say, look, let's get we can get away with you know fifteen or twenty thousandths here, or, or you know up to, up to a sixteenth. But that's where the interaction with our engineering or the engineering group with the foundry is is critical. I want to get back to this part um, where, you know, all the inside surfaces are drafted. However, you know, the end usage, this, all the outside surfaces had to be machined. So it just depends on, on the type and application of the part and where, where your end usage is. Good question. Uh, so another question here from uh, uh, Patrick, um, you know, asking about over moldings again, is there certain sort of materials that aluminum versus zinc can be over molded with? Um, is that something we involve or you see involved in, in different uh, permanent mold applications where if you don't do it internally, you work specifically with the customer to make sure that that over molding application is, is out there and available? Yeah, and make sure that we're talking about over molding versus casting in a element. So uh, our, most of the experience that I've seen over the, over the last number of years is they over mold a lot on aluminum parts. Um, the zinc parts tend to be more of a, a finish type thing where they'll put a, a you know some sort of a polish to it, a, a powder coat. Um, but most of the over molding that I've seen is in uh, consistent with the aluminum casting more than anything else. The other thing, though, is to is to keep in mind that we can cast in, you know, inserts and that type of thing, which has been called over molding in, in other applications. So, uh, making sure we're talking about the same thing here. Uh, another good question here from Joe: uh, Does the size of the part, maybe even the mold, have any play in mold life? I didn't hear that. Does the size of the part have any with mold life? So, bigger parts do the mold less? Is it a shorter life, or is that more than that? No, not, not necessarily. Um, does the size of the part have, play into that account? Um, you can, just because a part's a big, bulky, and heavy, if it's designed properly and for the casting technique, you can get a uh, good life out of your tooling. Uh, the same way with a small tooling, it, it, you know, it's the number of shots that go against the tool. Yeah, and working with the design up front, you know, if you're pouring metal in against a thin wall, that thin wall is going to deteriorate. However, maybe we can design in a, a section of that thin wall that's replaceable. So again, that's the thing up front we want to talk about with, uh, with you should talk about with the engineering group. So there's a question that was asked a little more specific here, but um, you know, how often is, uh, do you see permanent mold shops uh, do the secondary operations internally versus outsource? You know, when they're looking at maybe a break even on the, the tooling side, is there times where you're looking at outsourcing uh, secondaries versus insourcing? Yeah, that's really foundry specific. Um, we, we, you know, we've, so our company has made it, uh, it's part of our um, policy that we want to try to do every single thing we can in house. So we do polishing, we do engineering. You know, we do outsource some of the finishing, but to a sister company, and then we do outsource some of the heat treating. Uh, but 
you know, that, that, that's a great question. And the more a foundry can control it in-house, you know, the better lead times you're going to have, more control over the quality you're going to have. Uh, all those things just go hand in hand. Yeah. I agree with them on that one. Uh, good question here from Danielle. Uh, is there an advantage to not cooling the part of the mold? And what does what's the impact of the end result? So you had mentioned earlier on when you're designing the mold, any type of uh, cooling processes or cooling that you put into the mold uh, from chills, uh, gates, risers, how you, how you kind of set up the mold. Is there an impact on the part of the mold? And, and what's the end result? So if I think I understand the question correctly, uh, cooling inside the mold, um, there it's part specific again. Um, and Tim brought up a good point. If you've got a thick section and a casting, you may have to cool that portion of that casting down in, in the mold. Um, you know, the therms of the tool are designed to cool the casting correctly using the FEA software. Um, so you can keep a repetitive motion of the process. And that's what's key in, in the casting is just a repetitive motion of the process. Let me ask you a little different way. So Danielle's got a part that has to have an isolated thick section. Yep. How do you attack that in the mold? Well, you can, you can do that with risering. You can do that with uh, gating, a different type of process, uh, permanent mold-wise. There's multiple ways you can attack it. It's just what's best for the end use of the part. Okay. So if she, you know, if she can't live with this type of gating system on her part, then we would have to say, okay, we may have to go in with secondaries to remove it. Or if she can, we can polish a little bit of that off or saw cut that off or whatever needs to happen in order, you know, for that end part to work correctly. How about chills and different materials? Yeah, the, the chills are used for what, for that specific reason. You know, you can chill off a certain area of the part and that, you know, solidifies that that portion of that part quicker than the surrounding metal. And then you don't get your sinks and shrinks and, and things or cracking hot tears that might come up in a, in a casting. Can you guys speak to, so, you know, permanent mold gives the connotation that once you make the mold out of this steel uh, that's used in the permanent mold industry, can you speak to the challenges or strategies that you see in mold modification? Uh, Jason asked this, this great question you know, to help uh, accommodate design uh, changes to existing parts. So you can see de design changes over the life of a part or once it gets into production life, you can see a need from a customer's perspective that um, they may need to come in and add different uh, components to the mold or to the part. Can you speak to the, the challenges or strategies that you, you see across the permanent mold industry? Well, a lot of times what we do with the tooling, if there's, you know, multiple changes that are expected, and that could be with labels, that could be with different types of geometry in a specific area. Um, you know, that tooling is insertable. Um, so, you know, we can create inserts effectively to, to uh, combat that challenge. Um, as far as the, you know, the, the life of that, as long as it's designed correctly, it, it, it shouldn't be an issue with, with the life of the tooling. Yeah, yeah, I think per mole is very, um, what's the term? It, you know, I mean, it, we, it's not going to cost a lot of arm and leg to modify a permanent mold. Again, we don't have cooling jackets. You know, to, if it's mold, metal safe, if you're adding material, not necessarily a problem. Uh, can we, we've been in the, in the past taking dyes and molds and, uh, you know, inserted them. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. And permanent mold is a lot easier to do that with than, say, for instance, a die casting when you've got to deal with all those cooling jackets. Um, and just, you know, the geometry of, of, of tools. Our tools are much simpler than, than a lot of that type of tooling. So uh, much easier to do it in, in permanent mold. I guess, and, and then on the, the, to the first part of that question, if it's a global change to a part, if the part gets, the total part gets bigger or the total part gets smaller, um, that's, that's kind of a big factor on permanent mold. If it gets bigger, that's easy enough. We're metal safe on the tooling. This is kind of the term used in the industry. If it gets smaller, you're not metal safe, and now you're looking at uh, some possible more expense. Okay, great. 
Uh, Trevor, Tim, uh, really appreciate the the time here. Uh, love love all the the questions uh, that you guys had out there. Uh, we try to get as many answers as we could. We really appreciate the time of everybody coming on uh, to to really understand more about uh, you know permanent mold and, and everything that uh, you know comes across as far as questions go that we we see in the permanent mold industry sees. Uh, do want to remind everybody that we do have a webinar coming up on uh, December eighth at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Engineering's Guide to Metal Casting. And if, if you guys do have any questions or do have any uh, you know, specific questions for, for us uh, or for Batesville products, feel free to reach out. You know, we'd be happy to answer anything and, and help you uh, get in the right direction here. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.